This was a theory or a hypothesis. The way we checked it was by going to the lab, hanging weights off the hemipalvis, and then sectioning in different combinations and permutations these various soft tissues. When everything was left intact and only the ITB was sectioned, we found the hip would collapse into a varus mode, indicating the ITB to be truly a static stabilizer of the hip. Then going forward, we actually looked at the femur itself and did various sections of the proximal femur, measuring the amount of bone that was in the proximal femur, both medially and laterally. We defined that there was significantly more bone, as everyone recognized, on the medial side, but it was surprising to see just how much cortical bone was actually present on the lateral side. From these observations, we create a hypothesis that the iliotibial band could be considered a tension band on the lateral side of the femur. Tension band, somewhere as defined by the AO group in fractures, is a way of reducing and neutralizing tension loads and converting them into even compression loads. It was important for us to understand the contribution of the soft tissue, and we thought we had discovered something new, only to find when we went through the literature, this had been a concept that had been around for 150 years. We then moved to see if this could be created in computer models. We did 3D finite element studies incorporating the lateral bands, soft tissues, into the traditional hip models. Peter Walker at the University of London and other researchers at other institutions around the country were able to reproduce this, demonstrating that compression load did in fact occur on the lateral side of the femur. We then went to the next step. People criticized the computer models, rightly, that these could be manipulated. So we physically built a model trying to reproduce the contribution of the lateral structures. We used a beam to represent the pelvis, and rather than traditionally loading the femoral head in a predetermined magnitude and direction, we let a gravitational load be at the medial end of the beam, and we used a cable to crudely simulate the tension loads on the lateral side soft tissues. We then measured the loads in the proximal femur and found the resultant to be approximately 140 degrees. The consequence of this decade of work was to expand Koch's model, not to throw it away, but to expand it to include the soft tissues and create a dynamic model. As we began to add the muscles into our models, both in the computer and in laboratory simulations, we began to appreciate that there were different loads perceived in the proximal femur. We started to understand that the lateral aspect of the femur actually bore compression load rather than the tension load it was originally assigned in Koch's model. As we looked at this, we started to extrapolate this towards other applications, specifically hip replacement. Traditionally, hip replacements fail because the prosthesis lacks proper support. We thought that by understanding the lateral side to give us an additional potential base of support, by expanding the lateral aspect of the femur to include what's called the lateral flare, we would broaden the base of the prosthetic support, gaining better support of the prosthesis during weight-bearing activities, and stimulating proper bone response. Hence, the revelation design reflects this theory of expanding beyond medial, posterior, and anterior to include the fourth or the lateral side of the femur in the support of the device. So what we've done, based on our research, is come up with a design that seems to be more like a real hip. And as such, we put this into patients with an understanding that we're going to preserve the bone and hopefully gain a more stable implant over a longer period of time. It's proven to be the case for the last 17 years we've used this design. The Revelation Hip Stem is an improvement on traditional design concepts. What it does is it brings dynamism, vitality, movement into total hip replacement. We thought that there was a significant challenge in patients that were younger, with greater demands, larger body masses, or poor bone stock in people such as renal dystrophies. We used this design in these situations because we believed that it would preserve the bone that was present without adverse consequence. Because it did prove to be so successful in these very, very challenging environments, we found now that we don't have to restrict this design to just older patients. We can safely use this with greater confidence in a younger, higher demand patient with a hope for greater longevity of the device and less need for revision. This stem respects the fact that the bone is a living dynamic tissue that responds to its environment. It allows the bone to respond to use. It allows the bone to grow and to maintain its normal strength, integrity, and density. It's been shown in objective prospective studies to maintain bone density by resting on the femur and allowing the bone to do what it was designed to do, support the body's weight.